Good morning. I'd like to thank Tony for uh, playing for us this morning and offering that uh, ministry of music as we make preparations for our hour of worship. We do have some announcements this morning. I got kind of a long list here, so bear with me. Uh, the first one is I just want to say thank you to all those who came out uh, yesterday for our uh, spring cleaning day here at the church. We got quite a bit of things done. Everything that was on our list, I should say, we got done. And I appreciate that so much for all the help for everyone that came out and made that possible. Uh, we'll probably do another uh, maybe fall cleaning to kind of stay on top of things here. But just be mindful of the, the facilities and uh, help us uh, keep them clean whenever possible. We appreciate that. One thing that we did yesterday is uh, we kind of cleaned off the coat racks uh, around. We had some items that have been uh, uh, hanging around for a while, I guess you might say. But uh, one of the items that we found was downstairs and has been down there, as far as I know, for well over two years. And there is a suit that is now hanging in the uh, foyer on the coat rack back there that is uh, wrapped in uh, plastic. It is brand new, brand new suit. So if you happen to be a, uh, <laughs> this is a Shaquille O'Neal, very large suit, extra large for Shaquille O'Neal. So uh, if anybody you know who it belongs to, or if you think you could wear it possibly even, if you're that tall and that big as Shaquille O'Neal, uh, you might uh, look at that because it's been hanging around here for well over two years. Yes, Brian. So it's got to belong to somebody somewhere here, huh? But I think that was brought to give away. Oh, okay. So it's to give away. So if anybody can wear that, maybe Jeremy, maybe if you keep working out, maybe we can get you there. So, but anyway, uh, it's there. You might take a look at it. Uh, and there are some other items back there as well, hanging back here on the rack. Uh, so just be mindful of those. If nobody claims them, they're going to be given to a, a good cause. After the service this morning, we will have potluck. This will be our first potluck in well over two years. And so we encourage everyone to stay uh, for our potluck uh, down in the fellowship hall. We will uh, start having these monthly now, and they will have a monthly theme, and you'll get those updates as uh, time draws nearer to that potluck. Also, following the potluck uh, this, this, this afternoon, uh, Brother Neil Carricker will be sharing uh, some information that he's obtained uh, from attending a beekeeping seminar. Uh, the focus will be on bee capture boxes that he recently built and placed in the service and by some of those in the congregation who built those. So if anyone's interested, uh, it's very interesting on bees and the importance they are to our environment and uh, Mother Nature and her beauty. So that's right after the potluck in the fireside room, I believe. Also, uh, uh, next Saturday, uh, next at 11 o'clock, there'll be a memorial service here in the sanctuary for uh, Sharon Beck's mother. That is uh, Betty O'Rourke. That'll be next Saturday at 11. And because of that memorial service, there will be no priesthood meeting or gathering next Saturday morning. So be mindful of that. Next Sunday is May 1st, which is sacrament. And uh, normally we have that meeting on the Saturday before, but We'll, uh, that memorial service will take place here in the sanctuary at 11 o'clock, so no priesthood gathering next Saturday morning. Also, uh, the Grain Valley Congregation has invited us to a taco dinner and fiesta on next Saturday, April 30th, from 5 to 7. Uh, that will be out at the Grain Valley Congregation, so April 30th, 5 to 7. If you'd uh, like to go worship and share with them and some fellowship next uh, Saturday evening from 5 to 7. Vacation Church School will be June 6th to 10th, and again, that will be with the Grain Valley Congregation at Grain Valley this year. That'll be in the evenings from 6 to 8 p.m. Friday evening will be their closing worship service. Uh, if you uh, have any information or desire information or want to know about that, you can contact Emily Gromes, uh, Courtney, or Elijah Brock, and they are currently looking for uh, service projects ideas for their junior and senior high uh, youth, so be mindful of that. Also, uh, let's see, I got another one here. Uh, oh, that's from the Parkview Ladies. We'll have an activity. This will be at Mariah and Tony's house. Mariah is hosting this. It will be a Saturday, May 14th from 10 to 12. Uh, it'll be a uh, planting portable herb gardens. And so they would ask that you bring uh, some maybe soup cans and $5 to help with those uh, uh, herbs, I guess, the seeds or the plants. So that'd be interesting. So be mindful of that. That's uh, Saturday, May 14th from 10 to 12. 
And I think I've ran through them pretty fast. So if you got any questions regarding any announcements, uh, just please uh, see me and I will gladly pass those on to you. We look forward to the hour of worship to come. Uh, would you bow with me in a word of prayer, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for uh, this day and for the opportunity to come and to uh, spend this time with you. Father, we're thankful for this house of worship you provide for us and that we can come and to worship you and lift up our hearts, Father, in uh, praise and adoration. And Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to witness uh, another young one, Simon, who will enter to the waters of baptism and make that covenant with thee. Might you bless him, Father, in his response and his desires. And might you attend all those who have responsibilities this day and this hour to come, that you might bless them with your spirit, that through that, Father, we all might be uplifted and feel your presence. So we praise you and thank you and ask for your blessings now and throughout this coming week is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
I welcome you to the house of the Lord this beautiful Sunday morning, and it is with great joy that we gather this day that we might praise our God and that we might share in the experiences together, both in a baptism and confirmation and in the, the, the preached word. We have a great reason to rejoice, and even though last Sunday was the day that we chose to set aside and celebrate the res resurrection of Christ, that shouldn't have been the end of it, for sure. And I, uh, part of my rebellious nature, um, as I was putting together the program, we don't, we don't have the pre-printed uh, bulletins. And so I thought, well, I'll print something on the front just because. And uh, my thought was, uh, the day of resurrection has come and passed. Now what? I thought, no, that's a little bit too, too provocative. Uh, so it's blank. I apologize for that. Uh, I could have looked up a picture at least or something. But um, we aren't here to uphold men. We're up here to hold, hold up God before men, and that through us, men might see God. I want to bring a call to worship this morning from uh, John, the Gospel of John. It's in chapter 1, and um, this is uh, John the Baptist was, uh, of course, preaching, baptizing, and uh, I'm just going to start at verse 28. He it is of whom I bear record... He is that prophet, even Elias, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose, or whose place I am not able to fill. For he shall baptize, not only with water, but with fire and with the Holy Ghost. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin of the world. And John bare record of him unto the people, saying, This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him, and that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come, baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, When he was baptized of me, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him, for he who sent, for he who sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is who baptizeth with the fire, with fire, the Holy Ghost. I'm sorry. On him, the same is, is who baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Again, the next day after, John stood and two of his disciples. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following him and said unto them, What seek ye? They say unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him, that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. You know, I was talking with Corey about this this morning. Read the scripture numerous times, and for some reason... It stood out just this last time I read it. Andrew and Simon, because he went to his brother, and there was another. They knew Christ was there somewhere, and they were looking for him. They hung around John because they knew that John would identify him. And when it came to pass, they wasted no time. And Andrew went after his brother and said, we have found him. That's what comes next. And we should be at the same, same level in our lives, seeking out God so we can say we have found him. We're going to uh, go from the order of worship as printed pretty much. 
Uh, we're going to open with hymn number 186, which is one of the great resurrection hymns. Uh, and then uh, our brother Brandon will bring the invocation following that. 186. most kind and gracious Heavenly Father. We come to you at this time thanking you for the opportunity to come and worship you. We thank you for this place that we can draw apart from the world and join together and share in each other's presence to hear the word of God and to feel your spirit pray that you um, would be with us during the service for all those that are participating for the baptism and for the message to be sh shared. I pray that you would guide uh, the thoughts of our speaker as he um, desires to share a message of hope and love that you have placed on his heart. I pray these things in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. I know that he lives. I woke up early this morning, very early. And the words of a hymn get, that's been on my mind for several days, but this morning came to my mind and says a charge to keep I have. Simon, this is for him. Follow not after men to sin, but walk upright before God. Keep his commandments. Do not deny yourself ungodliness. Look up and seek the Lord's will, and you will not be alone. The Lord says, my spirit will follow me like a river for those who seek me out. Praise God. 
Thank you, the Lord has surely blessed you in so many simple ways. In your name, in your heritage, in your seek for understanding, in your walk by the brook, in your vision, in your cousins, in your choice of friends, in your choice today. Simon Isaiah Brock, dweller by the brook, what is in a name? In your name, Simon, I see a man who could walk on water as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. And when he took his eye off of Jesus, he began to sink into the water. But Jesus had plans for this man, and he reached out his hand and saved him. And now this man was a fisherman. And when Jesus first saw him and his brother Andrew, they were working with their father and his servants. And he called out to them and he said, Come unto me and I will make you fishers of men. The man, this man, Simon Peter, and Andrew, his brother, saw something special in Jesus. And they immediately followed him. And now Jesus took them and taught them. And Simon Peter learned well, and he became very devoted to Jesus. But he had to find out that he didn't know everything. He thought he would not deny him, but he did. He found out that Jesus was forgiving. He could not understand how Jesus could forgive him, so Jesus told him, you do not know me or what I came for, but, but when I'm gone, you will understand. I will send the Holy Ghost to be with you and to all those who take my name upon them and diligently seek after me, for they or they shall find me. Today he has the same gift for you. In your name, Isaiah, Isaiah, I see a man who had great wisdom. And in his day, Jesus had not come, but he was a man devoted to obtain spiritual understanding. And he sought to walk with up, walk upright before God, and he learned of his ways. He was lifted up into the heavens and saw God's plan of salvation. He saw Jesus and he believed in him. He prophesied of Jesus coming and many other things, even unto the end of time. And he gave counsel for the wise and for those who will hear. For all ages, he praised God and gave honor and glory unto him. From this day forward, Simon, when you hear your name, Simon Isaiah, you will hear the witness that God seeks you out, that he has called to you. He has a purpose in you as a peacemaker a guide and one who walks in the way. You will touch the hearts of those around you. They will know that God is. They will know of his son and they will have hope. God doesn't see any one of us as ordinary, but unique and a record was made in heaven, is made in heaven of our works. There was a poem written by a man named Thomas Chisholm, who described himself as just an old shoe. To those of you that are older, you'll understand that, a common man. He was born in a log cabin in 1866 in Kentucky, and he said, my income has not been large at any time due to impaired health in my early years, which followed me on throughout life. 
Although I must not fail to record here that the, the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God that he has given me many wonderful displays of his providing care for which I'm filled with astonishing greatness. This man wrote a poem that was later put to lyrics, as great as my face, thy faithfulness, because when you make this commitment, God also makes a commitment to you. This, the, this hymn or poem was based on the words written in Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. It is of God's mercies that we are not consumed because, of his, because his compassions fail not. And they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. In verse 1 in this hymn speaks of God's faithfulness revealed in his words from James, the book of James, verse one, or chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of light with whom is no variableness, neither turning shadow of turning. Of his own will, he begat us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Not speaking of you and me, first fruits. To be the example to those around us. Verse 2 tells us that God's faithfulness revealed in creation. The seasons, the sun, moon, and stars all continue in their courses perfectly, orderly, quiet, and quietly guided by God's hands without any help from us. Verse 3 reminds us of God's faithfulness revealed in our lives. He pardons all our sins through repentance. He fills us with peace assures us of its presence, gives us strength and hope and blessings too numerous to count. I'm going to read the lyrics of the, that were written. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. Thou hast been forever. Thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, all join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. I'm going to skip the chorus, and I'll read it at the last. Great is thy faithfulness. Let's see. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Drinks for today and a bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. The hymn reminds us of, that God's promises are true. He never changes, that his compassions never fail, that his faithfulness in Christ Jesus is more than good. It's great. 
time when you do well to hold fast to the words of James as a guide for your life and counsel for that which is to come. God doesn't need incredibly gifted or wildly famous people to proclaim the truths of his word, just faithful ones who live by his word, who are beacons in the night, who set examples to the world showing how great and faithful he is. His promises are sure to those who love him. He wants to walk with you, Simon. He wants to be at your side. He wants to be your best friend. He wants to talk with you all the day long. He wants to wake, wake with you in the morning. He wants to go to bed with you at night. He wants to grab hold of you. He wants you to grab hold of salvation through Christ Jesus. He wants you to, to reveal to you the mysteries of the kingdom. He wants you to be obedient and faithful. He wants you to ask him questions. He wants to answer your questions. He wants you to understand him. He wants you to praise him. He wants you to see him. He wants to say to you, enter in my good and faithful servant and come and make your abode with me. The congregation is going to remain seated and sing hymn number 241. Uh, and as we prepare for the baptism, uh, Simon and, and whoever else is coming up to help, uh, and uh, Brandon are going to take their places, and the rostrum is going to clear so that we can also view the baptism. And all young children, it's a tradition here, and we like this tradition. If you want to be up close, come up here on the, uh, the platform so that you can see Simon uh, being baptized. So we'll sing hymn number 241, and during this hymn, let's make our preparations for the baptism.
At this time, Simon Isaiah Brock will be baptized by priest Brandon Cox. Simon Isaiah Brock, having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Morning. morning. Anxious to open the word with you this morning. Glad we got the special music in first, though. <laughs> uh, if you want to read along, I'm going to read from the book of Alma, chapter 9, uh, starting at verse 14. Uh, but preface that with uh, historically in the 1830s, there was a time when uh, two people, Joseph and Sidney Rigdon, came across the fifth chapter of John, in verse 29 which discusses the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. And that caused them to ponder. From their ponderings, they actually had a vision which was written in the Doctrine and Covenants. That description leaves sometimes even more questions than it answers. A lot of long words, things like celestial and telestial, and, and um, maybe one of the headier sort of scriptures that we have well, hiding in plain sight, when we open the Book of Mormon, we find this same question was asked. And at verse 13, Now Zeezrom began to inquire of them diligently that he might know more concerning the kingdom of God. And he saith to Alma, What does this mean which Amulek hath spoken concerning the resurrection of the dead? That all shall rise from the dead, both the just and the unjust. 
and are brought to stand before God to be judged according to their works. You see, that's what we read also in John 5, uh, verse 29, where he states, Now they shall come forth, those who have done good, in the resurrection of the just, and they who have done evil in the resurrection of the unjust. So in the Book of Mormon, they ask that question. What is the Book of Mormon's response? The Book of Mormon response is plain and simple and precious. And to Neil's statement that he did not have written on the front of the Book of Mormon, it also helps us understand, or front of the bulletin rather, the Book of Mormon also helps us understand, so Jesus is resurrected and, and now what? That's where I'd like to go today. But Alma begins to answer this question, and he says, It's given unto many to know the mysteries of God. Nevertheless, they are laid under a strict command that they shall not impart only or accept according to the portion of his word which he grants to the children of men. That's an important phrase. When I read that, I realize it's saying something that, you know, God, there's a lot of mysteries, and, and we've been given a lot of answers, but the fact is, we're only supposed to impart or discuss or share that which has been written. And that's what he's given to us. And so then he shares a mystery. And it's very simple and yet very profound. And he states this in verse 17. And therefore, he that will harden his heart, the same receiveth the lesser portion of the word. And he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the word, until, they are, until it is given unto him to know the mysteries of God, until they know them in full. Is that the answer? When we receive the word of God, and if we harden our heart towards it, there's less, and if we don't harden our heart, there's more? Is that the answer? How does that fit to the resurrection of the just and the unjust? And he says, <clears throat> He that will harden his heart, to him is given the lesser portion of the word until they know nothing concerning his mysteries. And then they're taken captive by the devil and led by his will down to destructions. And he continues and he says in verse 22, And if our hearts have been hardened, yea, if we have hardened our hearts against the word insomuch that it have not been found in us, then will our state be awful. For we will be condemned. For our work will condemn us. Yea, all of our work will condemn us. We will not be found spotless. Our thoughts will condemn us. And awful is our state. And we dare not look up to God. So to a very profound question. Hey, what, when we stand before God this day of the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust, what are we judged by? And the answer to the question is simply this. Was the word found in you? Or was it not? Really? You see, he is just in all of his works. He is merciful to all of us. And he has power, and this is in verse 27 of the same chapter, he has power to save every man that believes on his name and bringeth forth fruit meat for repentance. So if the word is found in us, our hearts change our lives change, and the things we live for, or our response, becomes the thing by which we're judged. And if the word was in us, our, our works reflect that. If the word was in us, but we hardened our heart towards it, our works reflect that as well. And so when all these just or unjust people stand before God, the question is, was the word in you, and did you let the word grow, and did it change you, and were you changed by it? Or did you just remain in the same state? Now, this question then, to me, asks something very, very important. So I, what do we do with this word? What do we do with this word? And I want to answer this question also from the book of Alma. But, um, but if we turn just a little farther ahead to verse 54, I can't find a better summary of the plan of salvation given to us. And starting at verse, chapter, Alma 9, verse 54, God did call on men in the name of his son, this being the plan of redemption, which was laid, saying, if you will repent and harden not your hearts, 
Then will I have mercy on you through my only begotten Son. Right? If you change and you don't harden yourself against the word, you'll get mercy. That's guaranteed. Therefore, whoso repenteth and harden not his heart, he shall have claim on mercy through my only begotten Son to a remission of your sins, and you will enter into God's rest. And whosoever will harden his heart and will do iniquity, I swear in my wrath that they will not enter into my rest. So all this then asks, for me, I ask this question then, so what do we do with the word? How do we have the word? Um, turn, if you will, now up to Alma 16. I, I want to preface just with a, with a couple scriptures, and this is the other one. So Alma 16 is full of a lot of good information, and one tidbit contains a discussion Alma and Amulek, again, are having now with the uh, Amalekite people, the, the poor of these people. And Alma goes through a process, and I used to read this scripture, and I, it was just kind of, you know, fly over. I never really pondered it, you know, it just it kind of come back. He says, oh, yeah, he's talking about planting seed, and the seed grows, and then you have the word, and, and we're nourished by the word, and, and all this, and then we have this tree. And, and then I read it just recently, and I realized, no, it doesn't say that at all. It starts out that way, but it said something totally different. It says, Blessed is he that believes in the word of God and is baptized without stubbornness. And if you do this, he said, this is just like a seed planted in your heart. You see, we, we know these seeds. You, you might go to camp and you came back like on fire. That was a seed planted in your heart. Maybe that seed starts to swell. Or you had your Kirtland experience, or, or maybe it was your Waters of Mormon uh, time when those seeds get planted in our heart. But he says, hey, the seed was a good thing. He said, you even understand that perfectly. He said, but was that all? He says, no, your faith was dormant. Your faith was dormant. And he said, Un unless your faith grows, he said, you'll never have the tree. And if you don't have the tree, the word isn't found in you. And so this is what jumped out at me. He said, when he said he compares this word to a seed, and then he says, as this seed begins to grow, he said, you'll know that this is true. And he says, it's light, it's good, it's discernible. He says, is your knowledge perfect? No. You see, many of us stop at the seed when the seed is planted. And maybe the seed was planted the day you were baptized. Some years ago, I had the involvement in the lives of many people and the pleasure of baptizing several people and it's it's been some years and I, I honestly say I look back and I realize that for these people that I, I loved then and continue to love I they're not that active and you know while it breaks my heart I ask the question well why could that be and I haven't given up on them and the story is never over for us but this occurred to me that he said the seed was planted, they heard a great sermon or, or the scriptures touched them or you know these, these things got planted. But what has to happen, and this is what changed, he said, as this beginneth to grow in you, say let us nourish it with great care that it could get root and grow up. He says, now if you nourish it with great care, it will take root and bear fruit. But if you neglect it and take no thought, it won't get root. And he says, it's not because there wasn't a good seed planted. See, it's not because you didn't get baptized, or it's not because you didn't have a true testimony. He said, the ground was barren, and it wouldn't ever turn into more fruit. The goal. He says, and this because, and this is the point right here, verse 169, because you would not nourish the word. Now, you see, I always thought we were supposed to be nourished by the word. I thought this was the, the word was given to nourish us. Well, it might be true. But the point is, if the word is planted in your heart, now we need to do things to nourish the word. We need to do things that allow that word to grow in us. And this becomes the object of our lives. You know, the Israelites came through a short succession of wonderful uh, powers, you know, started with Moses doing miracles in front of Pharaoh, and then all of a sudden the seas open. That's a pretty big miracle. And the seas closed, and there go the Egyptians, and, and, and you know, gods with fire on the mountain. But then all of a sudden, you know, these were like seeds planted, but then all of a sudden they had 40 years of kind of loneliness and some dark 
times and dusty times. You see, that's when you're to nourish the word, the times in our lives to nourish the word. And, and so how do we do that? Um, about 10 years ago, my wife uh, read a book, and she did this with a friend. And the book is called Couch to 5K. And my wife, who at the time had delivered five children already in, in her life, uh, had uh, probably not run since high school. And she hated running. She thought she hated running anyhow, because running was the punishment your gym teacher gave you. You know, give me five laps, Howard. You know, that was it. And this was what running meant to her. But she and a friend read this book, you know, two moms, OK, just moms, right? You get it being moms, right? Who wants to go run when you're a mom? You run after your kids, and that's about it. But she reads this book, and the book was written by a guy who wanted to encourage his own mother to run. And he, he doesn't start with running. He starts with just walking. And you walk a little bit. And then after you've walked for 10 minutes or so, take a break. And then you do it again tomorrow. Maybe you do 12 minutes. And then during your run, you might pick something 100 feet in front of you, you know, kind of from here to the sidewalk. And you just walk a little faster. And then you stop. And then you do it again. And, it, and you develop this discipline where over time, those little faster runs become walks, become a little slow jog, and for 100 feet or so, all right? It's, it, it's not that hard. But when you have that resistance and you meet the resistance, your mind learns, hey, I overcame that. I had a little simple challenge. My body that doesn't really want to move, I made it move a little bit, and I succeeded. And that gives you confidence, right? You, you kind of nourish your body with a new confidence. Well, so believe it or not, a bunch of that work and my wife and her friend, they, they ran the 5K. And I thought... Well, good for them. I thought it was kind of a one-and-done deal, though. And so my wife, I thought, would never run again. It was just sort of the thing really she did with a friend. But 5K led to another 5K. 5K is three miles. You know, you can stand on any hill around here, and I bet you can't see three miles. It's a long way, right? I mean, who's going to get up and run three miles, right? Well, she ran three miles, and then she did another race, which was six miles, a 10K, and she did a couple of those. And then... It was more of the same. You just run a little farther, you add to it, you, you slow down when you're feeling challenged, but you, you don't quit. And this is the point, is that when you're learning to run, you see the 5K turned into a 10K, and the 10K turned into a 20K or a half marathon. And after she did a half marathon, she did a full marathon, which is 26.2 miles. All right, now how do you get from nothing going to the couch to a marathon? It's by not quitting. You see, you're not practicing how to make your legs move. You're practicing how to make your mind not quit at a challenge. You see, and this is what the word becomes for us. See, I in my life, I had this disconnect. It's like, oh, I go to church, and now that I found the church, and I, I figured out this array of churches to join, and I found the right church, now I'm just waiting for Zion, but all these hard things are happening in my life, and it's like there was a disconnect there. And I realize, you know, the hard things happening in my life are the spiritual resistance, just like my body's resistance to moving, our spiritual resistance that teaches us how to overcome. And when we learn to overcome these things, little things at first, we can, we can endure greater. The, the problem is, unlike running, when you can choose the time and the duration that you want to run and you can train your mind not to quit, um, we don't always know in life how many challenges we're going to have, uh, the nature of the challenges, how long they're going to last. I mean, some can last an hour, some can last a decade. But the point is, Jesus prepares us for these things. And so when we practice not quitting, you know, my wife didn't stop with the marathon. In fact, she ran a 50-mile race once, started before the sun was up and ended after the sun was down. She did the uh, a half Ironman, which is where you propel your body 70 miles through swimming, biking, and running. And I joined her on a couple of those. And last year, she did uh, you know, kind of what some people might say is the pinnacle, a full Ironman, which is a 2.4-mile swim, 112-mile bike ride, all in the same day. And then you throw in a full marathon, 26.2 miles, just for good measure after that. And, and so... Um, and she wants to do it again. And when she finished that race, she had energy to spare. Now, why? Because she had trained not just her legs to move and her heart to pound, but she had trained her mind not to quit. And so when we learn how to train our mind not to quit in, a spiritual, in spiritual things, 
we then are nourishing the word in us. <clears throat> you see, it's interesting when Jesus spoke here in America and in, in, in Israel, and I'm sure to other places that people that we don't know about, he said, you know, blessed are the meek, for you'll inherit the earth. Well, that means if you're meek, you're controlling your strength. You must be living in a world where people don't control their strength or abuse their authority, right? That's the spiritual resistance. Often in spiritual things, it's not whether you will move, but whether you will remain. The Hebrew word for faith means to be firm and steadfast, firm like a wall. So, in other words, when we are in our desert of our life, can we learn to be meek when others around us aren't? That's meeting the resistance. That's saying, I can do this. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. That means we're going to live in a world of people who are unrighteous at times. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. That means you'll be around people who will not show you mercy. But when you're training your soul to respond to Christ, will you be merciful anyhow? You see, that's the 5K that leads to the 10K in our life. Blessed are all the peacemakers. You'll be the children of God. Because you're going to live in a world where there's sometimes no peace. And will you keep your spiritual heart beating? Will you keep your spiritual legs moving for the Christ who died for us? You see, these are the ways that we nurture the word in us. These are the ways that we end up teaching ourselves how to resist temptation and how to overcome the world. And the saddest thing for me is when I see people who had the seed planted, but then they never learned to nourish the word. You do that through adversity, okay? You know what? Maybe we shouldn't do so much as say, hey, will you join the church? You know, pat them on the back and now just good job and we're going to wait for Zion. Maybe the point is you pat them on the back and say, Jesus said, you're going to face tribulation. And these are things you'll face tribulation in. And don't worry, there's a lot of people who face tribulation. Every one of us are living through tribulation, right? Every one of us, though, if we face that tribulation and respond the way Jesus said, is we are learning to nourish that word. And when that word is in us, if we have nourished the word, it will grow into this tree that bears fruit. Some years ago when I first lived here, I first moved here, I worked for John and Juanita Payne, or I'm sorry, Ralph and Juanita Payne on their farm and worked with their son, John, for one summer and loved it, Great, a lot of great stories. They were truck farmers, so to speak. They planted vegetables, and, and I got to be with them through the early spring, summer, fall. So I got to see kind of all the process of things they do. And in the spring, they had planted tomatoes in these little hotbeds that was just basically horse manure, in a box with like a window on top and they plant just literally scatter seeds out of tomatoes and tomatoes by the hundreds would just grow up and they'd all be just thick uh scraggly little plants and they'd, they'd tear these out of the ground but they wouldn't do it in the in the morning they'd wait till the evening when the sun was behind the hill and they'd tear these out of the ground and they'd, they'd kind of wrap them in newspaper and soak the newspaper and then in the evening go out to the field and i got to do this with john i rode the tractor and pulled john in this old little jalopy type looking contraption, probably from the 1940s. This metal little cart had a water tank on it and a little plow. The plow would kind of cut a little divot as I'd pull them on the tractor. And every so often, just mechanically indexed off the wheels, it would splat out a little water about as size your fist. And as I'm pulling John, he would wait for that splat of water and he'd stick a tomato plant in there. And that thing would just be laying flat on the ground. And the, and the, and the back of the little contraption the planter would come close that furrow right up around the plant and as long as those plants got hit where the water was overnight they'd sit there and they'd kind of start to perk up a little bit and they'd have enough water and they had enough time out in the evening where they could regain their strength if we had done that during the heat of the day those plants wouldn't have made it right they had to get enough nourishment and they had to be planted in that water long enough to, so, to where they could survive because there was going to be thousands of plants out there and you know, most of them did, but if you, if you got a plant and it didn't hit the water, it didn't make it the next day. See, we need a certain amount of nourishment, but we need to realize, just like those plants, uh, that they have to have the right combination. And we find this combination 
in our in our word. Um, this sermon will be a little bit more like a TED talk because we've got great things to to look forward to today. But I would encourage you to consider that um, God's word is to nourish us. But let's realize these opportunities he gives us to respond to his writings, to respond to his guidance so that we can become his people. Thanks. At this time, uh, one of the tremendous blessings that we enjoy in this church is to witness the uh, giving of the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. And uh, Simon Brock uh, will be uh, confirmed, as we call it, uh, by Patriarch Evangelist Howard Brock, his grandpa, and by uh, Elder Jonathan Brock, his father. So if you guys will come up at this time and take your places. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the gift of life, and we are thankful for the opportunity that we have in this life to be aware and be a part of, and the privilege that it is to be a part of this gospel in this church. And as we come before you this, this day, we do so, Father, recognizing that we are totally dependent upon Thee for everything in our life, and that we can do nothing without You. And so we are thankful for the strength that You give us, and that sustaining power that keeps us uh, moment to moment. We stand before You, Father, as men, uh, as uh, men called, uh, by your voice into your priesthood. And yet we know our failings and our shortcomings. And so we ask thee this day for the strength that we need to do that which is before us. For we know that uh, this does not come of us, but it comes from thee. And so we pray that you would uh, forgive us of our shortcomings and our failings and that you would give us the strength that we need in this moment that indeed the gift of the Holy Ghost would be given to an individual who has uh, begun his covenant walk with thee and as he has entered into the waters of baptism. And so, Father, we pray for strength and for guidance that we might do these things that uh, we might bring honor and glory unto thee and not unto self. And so we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Simon, Isaiah, we as elders uh, in uh, this church do place our hands upon your head at this time to baptize you with the gift of the Holy Ghost and that he might uh, pour out his spirit upon you and upon your life from this day forward in great measure that you might be able to walk and talk and cultivate that relationship not only with the Holy Ghost but through that relationship with the Holy Ghost with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he might be a constant companion in your life and that you might learn to uh, recognize his presence and that you might learn to speak and to converse in ways that uh, become two-way conversations and that when you ask, you receive an answer. And so through this baptism of the Holy Ghost and through the confirmation that uh, comes into your life at this time, 
we confirm you uh, a member of this church, formerly known as the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, now known as the Community of Christ, with all the rights and the privileges and the responsibilities that go with such membership. And may you seek to walk with a, a man of character, a man of strength, and walk uprightly before your heavenly Father all the days that are before you. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We'll conclude the service uh, with hymn number 194. We'll stand and sing this hymn together, and our brother uh, John Brock will bring the benediction. Uh, just a reminder, there is uh, a potluck following the service. Everyone is invited to stay. Don't believe if you didn't bring food that there won't be enough to eat, because I'm pretty sure a lot of people brought extra. So uh, please avail yourself of the opportunity to, to visit with the saints and to, uh, to share with them. It's breaking bread, not just physically, but also spiritually. That's 194. Father, Lord, I am uh, grateful to be here this day and for the things that are uh, around us, the many blessings, Lord, that you've given to us, and what we have just witnessed before us this day, Heavenly Father. I am indeed grateful. And so I would ask that as we part here that we might take with us, Lord, the uh, charge that was given, the reminder of the covenant that many of us have made. And a reminder, Heavenly Father, of the blessings, Lord, that you've given to us and the promises that lie before us, if we but seek you out. And might we take to heart, Lord, uh, the example that Corey gave to us, Lord, uh, of preparing ourselves. It is easy to get overwhelmed to look at everything at once, but if we take one step at a time, and as we know that we can rely on you, that you will give us the strength to overcome. And so it is that we look forward to today, Heavenly Father, of your return. 
that we might be about your work and your honor and your glory, that we might all be in peace and at rest. And so it is, these things I would pray in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.